A record a movie, an iced whipped smoothie. R minus me will review each ruby with video games and TV shows through visual audio. Blender and scroll away. If you take the Final Fantasy series, the Pokemon series, turn-based combat, Alice in Wonderland, a brother, a sister, the innocence from Kingdom Hearts 1 vanilla version, the chibi lilican art style from Izumi Sawa, and the god tier illustrations from Nomura all wrapped up with the art of stacking, you will get World of Final Fantasy for the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation Vita, but also World of Final Fantasy Maxima. That was easy. My name's Art Minus Me, the taste of ink is getting gold and it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and welcome to episode 1 of Blender Reviews, where I will be covering my 50th favourite video game of all time, World of Final Fantasy, for the PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, and World of Final Fantasy Maxima for the Nintendo Switch. So, what are you waiting for? Grab a smoothie. Ah, kick your feet up. It's a hell of a view when you're watching Blender Reviews. The year is 2016. Too many obnoxious superhero movies were released. Hulk Hogan leg drop score comedia. The Chicago Cubs actually won a thing. And I lost my wife to the Pokemon Go phenomenon. And the world also lost the greatest musician of all time, an 80s icon Prince. Rest in power. And Britain votes to leave the European Union. Don't look at me, mate. It wasn't my fault. In October of that year, Square Enix would release World of Final Fantasy for the PS4 and PS Vita. One month prior to Final Fantasy XV, the boy band Chronicles Dap Dap Edition. I was first introduced to the Final Fantasy series through my best friend's brother who had a copy of FF10 for the PS2 way back in 2002. A year that will basically influence this entire channel and have a huge impact on my life as a whole. Final Fantasy X was the first JRPG and heck, uh, RPG in general that I ever laid my eyes on and I was speechless. Prior to this I had never seen a video game so beautiful before and it captured my imagination like nothing else. In the 90s I grew up a Sega kid in the UK with the first game I ever played being Sonic 2 for the Mega Drive which was coincidentally also first experience around my best friend's house. In my later kid years I finally owned my first video game console with the PlayStation 1 after wanting to kick everyone one's ass in Tekken 3. Thanks mum dad. Best Christmas ever. But it was the PS2 and Final Fantasy X which made me realise video games can be works of art and more than just a kid's plaything. Throughout my teen years I went down the rabbit hole of JRPGs and Squaresoft turned Square Enix titles but as more and more time would go on, Square Enix subsequently lost their identity of what made Final Fantasy truly astonishing, alienating me from its core series. And despite people taking the FF10 laughing scene out of context for not relating to Titus because they never had a jock friend or played sports in their lives, I feel FF10 was the last true FF game we ever got. Everyone argues FF9 holds that title, and for hardcore traditionalists, I see your point, but when I think of Final Fantasy, I don't think of Tolkien-esque fantasy, MMORPGs, or pushing a broken car down a road. I think of an original world and setting beyond the norms of fiction with human storytelling that conveys deep emotions. So needless to say, with the disappointment of Square as a company and the mainline series of the 2010s decade, World of Final Fantasy was not on my radar at all of the time of its original release. I was actually really looking forward to another game at the time that was going to be released three months later. I was highly anticipating it because it had a demo of a game that I was waiting 12 bloody years for and it was held in my game hostage along with Noctis and the Backseat Boys. But I'm totally over it, it's fine. I'm over it. No, really. However, regardless of my personal feelings, I still craved something that had that Final Fantasy spirit. Since I knew I couldn't find it in the recent 2010 and beyond offerings of the mainline series anymore, I did some research on the main series classics I wanted to replay, and some Final Fantasy spin-offs. I played Final Fantasy Tactics. The battle system just wasn't for me. I played Final Fantasy VII. 
I recall I stopped after the honeybee in section, then I lost total interest after that. Played Final Fantasy VIII. I played Final Fantasy All the Bravest. <laughs> you get it? Because the game plays itself. And all I got was disappointment after disappointment. And yes, maybe I'm extremely picky with my JRPGs, but I've given this series so many second chances because two of the games in the series mean the absolute world to me. After thinking all hope was lost, I stumbled across a review on YouTube by Alpha Omega Sin. And Alpha, if you ever hear this, I miss your content on YouTube, buddy. But I love your Twitter, the one good thing about Twitter these days. And Alpha was explaining to the viewer how to not sleep on World of Final Fantasy and to give it a chance. And it had a Kingdom Heart 1 vibe to it. And that was enough to seal the deal for me. Plus, Shinji Hashimoto approached Hiroki Chiba to develop World of Final Fantasy because apparently few children actually played Final Fantasy games. After a corporate business analytical meeting they had that went a little something like this. More Pokemon! They wanted to cater to the JRPG players of our youth and future leaders of tomorrow. And I was a kid once, so I'm the perfect demographic for World of Final Fantasy. After picking it up, my only regret is that I didn't play this amazing title sooner. This is the part of the review where I like to obsess over the box art. Makeover, 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 makeover. I have here both the PS4 and PS Vita day one editions of the game, exactly the same cover art as the regular PS4 and Vita versions for both Europe and the US. And this comes with some exclusive DLC items that you can just get off the PlayStation Store anyway, so no worries there. I really like this cover art as a graphic designer because everything is placed perfectly, like it's bursting out of a confetti cannon, with the masked woman as the centerpiece, with the classic Final Fantasy logo illustration blended in at the bottom. This is the same for PAL and NTSC regions. The Japanese box art has the classic white background with the logo illustration in the middle, which I'm familiar with as they use this style for the mainline series, not only in Japan, but in Europe as well which I usually prefer, but in this case, the PAL and NTSC versions beat out the NTSC J Classic cover this time around. There is also a limited edition of the PS4 version with both PAL and NTSC territories, which has the same cover as originally shown, but comes in a cardboard sleeve art book style game case with an alternative cover on the art book. And this darker version has a lot going for it with the light side versus dark side face off ready to rumble look. However, the masked woman in the middle is not centered correctly and as a graphic designer it's sending my OCD through the roof. Oh that's better. And the reason why I didn't get this bad boy is because the same art book but bigger is in the collector's edition. <laughs> Okay, well, there's a lot of beef here. The World of Final Fantasy Collector's Edition comes in a huge cardboard box with the classic white Japanese cover, monster illustrations, aka mirages, on the side, but inside we have the Day 1 Edition game, three chibi, I mean Lilikin Final Fantasy figures of Cloud, Lightning, and Squall, I mean Leon, a soundtrack CD, the exclusive DLC items, and the giant illustrated art book previously mentioned. But the main event in this collector's edition for World of Final Fantasy is this pop-up art book. As far as collector's editions go, you can't get much better than this, and this is by far my favourite edition of World of Final Fantasy. Another edition of the game I almost completely forgot about, just like Sony did, is the PS Vita handheld console edition. Now sorry guys, I love collecting, but when it comes to PS Vita handhelds, there is another exclusive edition I went for instead. However, the artwork for the PS Vita World of Final Fantasy handheld is delightful with all the mirages on the airship with our brother and sister duo. So this is obviously the worst cover of all time. For the simple fact, this cover has false advertising in regards to airships. Or should I say airship? I'll let myself out. 
But all joking aside, it's a beautiful cover on the actual handheld itself. I've seen more white designs with gold mirages printed on the back. However, I have also seen some black PS Vita handhelds with gold illustrations of our heroes Rain and Lan. It got a re-release in 2018 with all the extra content and all DLC included titled World of Final Fantasy Maxima for the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One and PS4. But no physical edition for the PS4 which is f and a huge mistake, because for PS4 users, you actually miss out on three mirages because for some reason, these three mirages are not included in the Maxima DLC pack for PS4, but are included in the Xbox and Switch versions of the Maxima DLC. And speaking of the Switch, Switch versions only got a physical release in PAL and Asian territories, which is a real kick in the teeth. And for all 12 Vita users out there, you don't get the Maxima DLC content at all since the Vita can't handle it. The cover of the Maxima. Release, however, is not as good as the original NTSC slash PAL cover for me. I feel it's not as streamlined and it looks too thrown together at last minute for my liking. But you get all the DLC and bonus content included, right? Right? Well, all except for one thing, which I'll talk about later. So your winner of this contest, the collector's edition of World of Final Fantasy. But... Vanity searching aside, the Nintendo Switch version of World of Final Fantasy Maxima. is the definitive edition of the game, content-wise. Makeover, 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 makeover! Hang on just one bleeding minute. Why don't you have the Xbox One version in your collection? Hmm. Look, Shenron, it's nothing against green people or Microsoft. I just don't believe in Master Chief's political views, and Forza Horizon not being a car racer gives me serious anxiety. Have you seen Gears of Wars? That shit is way too manly for me. I can't pull that off. I'm a Sega kid, turned Sony teen, trying to play catch up with Nintendo Legacy Systems, so... You almost had me with Tales of Vesperia back on the day on the Xbox 360. But it's not me. <laughs> it's you. When you boot up World of Final Fantasy, you will be treated to a lovely illustrated logo and go ahead, press any button. World of Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy! World of Final Fantasy! World of Final Fantasy! World of Final Fantasy! Zip! World of Final Fantasy! I legit did this for 45 minutes straight and I don't think the creators meant for this to be that entertaining but I had a blast. 10 out of 10. Roll credits. Leave the memories alone. The main story of this game is segmented into the prologue, 21 chapters following, and a postscript. And right away we have a bunch of questions. We have a spooky girl saying TikTok, TikTok over and over again. She's either trying to promote her TikTok social media dance career or she has the attention span of a cat. But neither of those are true because it's the dream of a young boy, the brother. The brother awakes and I'm getting serious, wake up you lazy bum, KH1 vibes out the gate. The brother seems to not know where he is or why he has a mechanical arm that belongs to Stark Industries, but he's not alone because also next to the brother in the same boat is his sister. Could you be the most beautiful girl in the world? As they arise, they find themselves on a skyscraper which looks like a leftover from the world that never was, and the world surrounding is what will be known as Ninewood Hills. But was our TikTok sensation actually a dream at all? As our brother and sister do gain their bearings, they look pretty intoxicated, but in fact it looks like they are at the whim of our mysterious girl as she says, time to wake up. Our brother and sister fall. That's the game. Roll credits. Leave the but it turns out that dream was a dream as we awake as the brother for real this time. Or was it? 
No way. <laughs> this is a classic case of... And if things aren't strange enough already, we have this white rabbit fox on our head. None the wiser, he heads to work. Gotta pay them bills for our sweet new X Station 720. We arrive at work and it turns out you are a barista at Starbucks. I mean, star sucks, nailed it. With a customer waiting who's sporting the something about Mary classic hairdo, first the customer wants a pint. Comes to the realization it's four o'clock in the morning and decides to have a coffee instead with all the sugar. As we look up, we see the sister again. Could you be the most beautiful girl in the and mentions her brother's name, who is Lan. In the conversation, finding out the most beautiful girl in the world is actually called Rain. Purple Rain. Could you be? Now that bit makes way more sense, huh? Right off the bat, we find out Rain is the brains and Lan is the Lan of the operation. Rain realizes the world they live in is completely empty outside of themselves and the one customer who knows more than we think and makes up a name for herself on the spot as Anna Crow. And throughout our conversation, Miss Crow seems to have been watching our brother sister protagonist and knows more about them than they do themselves and finally breaks the ice that there's a birthday cake colored fox named Tama on Lan's head. You'll quickly learn Lan is not very bright, but we love him. Anna Crow has better things to take care of, leaving Tama to answering any questions our protagonists may have. Lan is freaking out and being a PC advocate uses the word honk instead of a swear word, but that doesn't mean I can't edit the shit out of Lan's dialogue. And how the can a fox even talk? Uh, who the put this thing on my head? Come on. What the is wrong with us? Despite the game telling you this game has two main protagonists, Rain is the main protagonist of this game, which I will discuss later in the video, but how people think in Final Fantasy X it's actually Yuna's story rather than Titus' story, the same can be applied here. World of Final Fantasy to me is Rain's story. Inside the coffee shop, Tama informs them that they are both Pokemon masters, I mean Digimon masters, I mean Mirage Keepers. And that's the reason for the sweet biotech tattoos they have on their arms. Apparently, Tama explains that we used to form a legion of mirages, aka Pokemon, and all of these mirages are powerful living illusions, and this group called the Pleiad sounds like a 90s Britpop band to me, giving us the ability to rule the world. And I have to mention here, Tama has Tama language, which means Tama adds the word the in random places of Tama's dialogue, such as in the fact, even the Pleiad answered to you and those are the seven strongest mirages of all. With their power, you could have the ruled over all the world. Tama, right to here. You take it from here. I'll go on ahead and link up a path. You the daddy. Some people have been incredibly annoyed by this, but I just find it incredibly adorable. <laughs> so to each their own with this one, just wanted to give you a heads up. I had a similar experience when I played uh, the second Prince of Persia game. Uh, I forget what it's called off the top of my head. I think it's called The Warrior Within. Every time you killed a guy, it drove me insane and made me put the game down and never want to pick it up again. No, 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 no. Who wants to die first? This whole coffee shop segment teaches us about Pokeballs, I mean uh, Prismariums, and the basic combat tutorial of the game. It's really basic stuff, uh, it's turn based, so if you've played JRPGs or RPGs before, the tutorials in this game are extremely well done, They're sometimes too well done at times, but if you have any questions, the tip jar section in the main menu can help you if you are a tutorial skipper, like I am sometimes. And if it wasn't obvious to you already, we have the classic JRPG trope of our main protagonist heroes having amnesia. But then again, I could argue every game in the world has the amnesia trope. Just listen. How did those jelly beans from Fall Guys forget their society and become a play toy for awful humans? How did Mario forget his creepy dark plumber past? And how did the car packs in FIFA forget they were actually footballers on a pitch once upon a time? A tired trope, yes. But executed extremely well in this game. It doesn't insult your intelligence with it. Just used to set up the plot and lead our Mirage Keepers to find out who they truly are. And a crow arrives back from her Harry Met Sally business. In cryptic fashion, hits the hammer on the head once more that we've lost all of our memories and wants to show us her magic gate.
Hey, 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 come on, guys. Get your mind out of the gutter. I see you back there in the red with the Moogle hat. Will somebody think of the children? The gate leads to the world of Grimoire where we can collect all the mirages we've lost. And Enacro definitely has an ulterior motive, pushing Rain and Lan to journey to Grimoire, saying you'll find out more about your past and even your family. With no second thought and wanting to remember their past, they jump through the gate. The World of Final Fantasy team, upon its original release, utilized the Orochi 3 engine for its game, for the PS4 and Vita. I must say, and I'm on the PS4 Pro, which was my main playthrough for this review, they did a fantastic job here. It's not going to revolutionize the industry with its graphics, but I'm okay with that because I've grown rather sick of Square Enix continuously chasing down the never-ending abyss of the most realistic looking game they can ever create since Final Fantasy VII. And in some respects, I feel like it's held them back creatively with its recent offerings, so I'm extremely happy that World of Final Fantasy went for style over horsepower. Having said that, the game still presents beautiful water effects and wonderful lighting that shouldn't go unnoticed. The PS Vita version of the game does have a bigger difference in regards to pixelated models and set pieces outside of the cutscenes, but nothing that will stop you from enjoying the game. It basically looks like a high-end PS2 title on the go within gameplay. But despite this, it still holds its dashing charm. For the Maxima. release for PS4 and ports to the Xbox and Switch, they upgraded to Orochi 4 and it improves everything. The Switch version, for example, is a big upgrade from the PS Vita version, especially portably. And yes, like all Switch games, in handheld mode, it looks lesser than docked mode, but still better than the Vita version for me. So if you are a dirty little graphics Jezebel, that is superficial as f The best looking version of World of Final Fantasy is the PS4 Pro slash Xbox One X version of the game. Followed by the Nintendo Switch version, but not by much, by any means, and I would happily do a full playthrough on the Switch. And then in last place, we have the PS Vita version. As far as the art direction for World of Final Fantasy, Maxima. It's a tale of two styles. The characters in giant form were illustrated by our lord and saviour Kanye West, I mean Tetsuya Nomura. I won't do too much of a deep dive on our messiah here because one, we all know this guy's story by now, and two, I think we're going to have plenty of time to talk about Nomura. Nomura gets criticised for over-designing his characters, but that cannot be the case here with World of Final Fantasy, because Rain and Lan look extremely stylish, along with our other giant human-esque characters in this game. Nomura didn't phone it in here. Wonderful character designs as always. Now for the Mirages and Lilikin, the chibi characters if you will. These characters were illustrated by Yasuisa Izumi Sawa, who might not be as particularly well known as Nomura-san, but you should definitely Definitely not sleep on Izumi Sawa's work. Izumi Sawa started with Square Enix doing pixel art for the mighty Xeno Gears and was heavily involved with the Crystal Chronicles subseries. You actually get to see some crossover work with the undead Princess Mirage, originally being from Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Echoes of Time with a cheeky cameo appearance. The Mirage designs here represent the Final Fantasy series so well, and I think Mr. Izumi Sawa did an amazing job here. Mr. Izumi Sawa also did the illustration for the Chibi Lily characters as well and I have to hold my hands up this originally made me not sure about the game at first I didn't hate the style I was just too wrapped up in my own teen angst BS that never seems to leave but I'm glad I gave this game a chance because finding out that it actually weaves into the lore and gameplay using Lilican form is a huge upside for me I love when games integrate art design with gameplay and storytelling all at the same time now let's talk about the actual gameplay for World of Final Fantasy. Maxima. It can be summed up with one math equation. This game is a turn-based JRPG and quite frankly, that's what the Final Fantasy series should be. Look, if Persona 5 and Dragon Quest can still pull this off in the modern era, there is no reason why a high-budget Final Fantasy mainline series game couldn't do the same thing. When in the heat of battle, you have a player meter on the side of the screen which emulates the grandier battle system, which is a huge plus. Once reached to the top, it will be your turn or your opponent's turn to attack, defend, etc. During status, elemental attacks like sleep or slow down buffs, it can stop slash slow down your character's meter delaying your turn. 
you get two options on how you would like to navigate your battle menu. There is the basic style and the classic style, which you can switch on a dime with personally being an aspiring senior citizen, I prefer using the classic style battle menu. And the only time I switch to the basic one is when I want to monitor my champion super move sphere meter when I can launch that super champion attack. It's your standard fare here, you have attack, special abilities, items, escape, defend, but where the game gets interesting and super fun is in the art of stacking, champions, uh, pokeballs, I mean prisms, and uh, mega mirages. So before entering the battle, we've already discussed you can either be a giant or a lilikin, which is more than just the art style preference. It actually weaves into the gameplay uh, with the art of stacking by holding L1 and pressing square or circle outside of battle it changes rain and lan from sexy anime pinups to chibi q uh, bambinos in giant form they are the large stack the base of the pyramid if you will and in lilican form they are the middle stack the square juicy burger in the delicious wendy's baconator why would changing the size of rain or lan matter well this corresponds with stacking with our Pokemon, I mean Digimon, I mean Dream Eaters, I mean Yokai, I mean uh, Bakugan, I mean uh, Duel Monsters. When it comes to these gotta catch them all kind of things, they're not really my bag. Like I respect the hell out of Pokemon and hell I even encouraged my wife recently to finally catch all Gen 1 Pokemon in Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu. But the closest I ever got before World of Final Fantasy with liking this style of game was the Dream Eaters in Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. And while the Dream Eaters were cool and all, there were a few I didn't like and that was kind of my problem with all these uh, gotta catch more mon kind of games. I wanted to actually like what I was catching with the time I put in. And lo and behold, I love every character design in World of Final Fantasy. Maxima. You have cute ones, unique ones, emo ones, hipster ones, sexy ones, body guy ones, the works. And all these mirages can range from small, medium, and large. For stacking with our heroes, Rain and Lan, this will boost HP, attack stacks, you name it. But when you get to the gotta catch them all point of the game, you'll have to use the strategy of stacking and unstacking to catch the tree meters in question. And to catch these mirages, they require more skill than this chucking a pokeball after feeding them round trees fruit pastels laced with Charlie chalk. Scanning the mirage with Libra will tell you the criteria for catching in Prism your mirage with your Pokeballs. Prism. When catching mechanical or Cogna mirages in this case though, you will use a different type of Pokeball in an Eld box. After you have enough mirages under your belt, it's time to use the Mirage Board which is just a leveling up system that makes you spend the SP you earn in battle on new abilities and stats throughout your adventure. This board grants you not only new abilities but blank spaces for custom abilities too. Transfigurations, Digivolving, Mirror Jewels, which are extra buffs to add to our heroes for additional abilities and stat boosts. The XL Mega Mirages. These guys are the big boy beasts, the Amazons, the Brothers of Destruction, the Gurren Lagan gunmen of Gunmen, the Shaquille O'Neals that requires the Shaquille O'Deals for your character's AP. And after every attack, your XL Mirage AP goes down, so they are good for landing mega blows after building up some AP. And you can only have 12 on your journey, so choose why. Or just throw all that out the window and choose your favourite ones like I do. The champions in World of Final Fantasy are the allies of Rain and Lan that they meet along their main quest and side quests that can be obtained and used as summons. Think of the Aeons from Final Fantasy X. That's what the champions are with Super Saiyan special moves that can be used once the champion meter is filled up to the brim, racking up stars with a max being 3. Some champions require 1 star, some 2. Here are some awesome champion summon moves in action. Lon, Rain, you need me?
If you are a Pokemon fan that is tired of the same formula and you have the tiniest bit of interest in World of Final Fantasy, Maxima. I think this game is a must buy because why yes, it is a son of Pokemon but it does do a lot to stand out from the rest of the Poke clones out there. After completing the story of this game, it's clear to me the narrative is about being a Pokemon master. It's about discovery and acceptance. Because the story is like many if not all JRPGs being extremely long, I have to take about 27.5 rebels to tell this whole story in a timely manner so this review isn't 7 hours long. On a journey to discover who we truly are and where we came from, we meet Princess Sarah from Cornelia. She tells us Grimoire is under pressure of being overtaken by the Bahamutian Federation, led by the Time Eater from Sonic Generation's cousin, the Herald King, Brandilis. And some regions have already succumbed to the Federation's power being chained down by the man. But all is not lost, as the Azura prophecy states, When the time begins, it's March time anew. They shall return as visitors, giants from the hills of a world not our own. Upon Grimoire, they will wreak two divergent futures, one that brings salvation, the other ruin. An enigma to confound even the highest mind. This is a giant, no pun intended, foreshadowing for the end of the game. The best and most important lore dump, however, comes from our best Lilikan girl, Yuna. Could you be the most beautiful girl in the world? With Yuna's introduction, they learn about their mum, Lady Luce, who was Grimoire's first champion protecting Grimoire, and also we learn about the three heralds that are still located in Grimoire. They are the King Brandilis, a Knight Rufio parrot looking being in Pelinor, and Jim Goldface Halpert, Sir Seguarides, who is a reference to a zone seeker from Final Fantasy VI. These three, along with a mysterious masked woman and her carbuncle mirage, are essentially leading our twin heroes down a path that's oblivious to them. Especially Lam, because at least Rain questions things throughout their adventure. Seeing as this is a celebration of the Final Fantasy series, everything is a nod and a reference to one game in the series or another. I love how self-aware of the series this game is. For example, the infamous Titus laughing scene gets a nod. It makes me just want to laugh out loud! I have no idea how to react to that, so I'm just gonna ignore you. And one intervention side quest is called I Hate Lightning. And also in Cornelia Castle, in the window pane, it's actually a screenshot from Final Fantasy 1. The guys at Square Enix with this title did a great job, not only the East history with Final Fantasy, but also the Wests. A lot of adventure hijinks ensues, from turning into sexy vampires, riding splash mounting, and dancing on the ceiling in the sunken temple, while meeting a lot of different champions, like the John Cena of the series Cloud, Louis Vuitton model Lightning, Cara Delevingne eat your heart out, Leon from Kingdom Hearts 2 and from nowhere else alright, and the three best Final Fantasy girls in Terra, Yuna and Celeste. Could you be the most beautiful girl in the world? Along with many many more. Along our journey, Yuna, Rydia, and Aiko get Lily kidnapped by Pelinor, and everyone seems to know more about this thing called the Crimson Prophecy than the Azure Prophecy. The Crimson Prophecy states, Giants from the hills will collect four keys, open a pathway to the crystal tower, brave its dangers, and mount the very heavens. And we fulfilled that prophecy, but turns out the Crimson Prophecy was a lie this whole time, a rumor created by Seguarides to lead our twins into a false sense of security because they were trying to help what they thought was their mother trapped in a cage, but it was actually their older sister, Awen, who is angry that we've now repeated history for a second time, causing destruction and now this time the Bahamutian Federation being able to gain access to the Ultima Gate and take over Grimoire once and for all, spreading Cogna Mirages across Grimoire. Cogna Mirages are basically Robotronic Mirages if you will. A crazy plot twist I sort of saw coming but still my favourite in this game is with the Masked Woman. You see, the Masked Woman is the one who really guides our heroes down the Crimson Prophecy path laid out by Seguarides to do the Bahamutian's dirty work. 
The masked woman, however, is just an illusion of a female presence similar to Owen, visualized by the carbuncle mirage. So the masked woman was just a red herring this whole time, and the carbuncle was the puppet master. It's my favorite part in the story, hands down. Thanks to your boy, Titus, and the rest of the champions, we retreat to Balam Garden. After some more intervention side quests and such, we head towards the Herald King Brandalus for the final battle. But first, we learn a bit more about our past. We learn about how before the amnesia, we were cocky and overcome by our Mirage Keeper powers, and it was actually our faults for the Herald entering Grimoire in the first place. We battle Pelinor and Seguarides and win, but learning in the process, Seguarides and Pelinor are actually our mum and dad respectively. Pelinor is Lady Luce, Seguarides is Lord Rory, who we learn about towards the end of the game. And ultimately, it was Lan and Rain's fault for the power corruption entering Grimoire. Lan has an emotional bait and switch from comic relief character to an extremely serious one. With a Iron Man transformation to his arm, goes for the final blow on Brandilis, sacrificing himself, being imprisoned forever. Full of regret and sorrow, Rain takes her ball and goes home. Lost like tears in the rain. That's the game. Roll credits. Leave the memories alone. Shut the front door, that can't be out of At Ninewood Hills, we have the time traveling shopkeep in Chocolate. However, you can only get items from her at Ninewood Hills, nowhere else in the game, unfortunately. Anywho, she looks like a hipster coffee shop employee who's just about ready to join the carnival. Chocolate is a reference slash reimagining or demake slash de evolution, if you will, of the choker chick from Final Fantasy 13 2, who is also a time traveling shopkeep in that game as well. But she looks more like she has an OnlyFans and is a furry pole dancer. But there's nothing wrong with that, that's your thing, but how the f*** did this turn into this? A couple of blocks down from the bird lady, we have the most sus looking mother f I've seen. In Final Fantasy staple favourite, Tom Berry. Look at him! He's one of those Illuminati lizard people in a druid trench coat with a lantern and a f***ing knife. Final Fantasy staple or not, there's no way I'm doing business with this guy. So you do business with this guy and find him in the middle of a tea in the Sahara Coliseum desert with a f***ing knife. Am I the only one creeped out here? In the side quest with Tom Berry and friends, he does actually come across as a pretty cool guy. But once again, he is the imposter in your Among Us party. He is the nightmare before Christmas. He is sus as f and has a f***ing Knife! Moving quickly along so we don't get shanked, we have the Cactuar Conductor. This voice actor, Andy Morris, does a fantastic job with this small role and gives me serious Mayor of Townsville vibes from the Powerpuff Girls. And it wouldn't be a Final Fantasy game without our resident Sid cameo. Sid, for those uninformed, always plays a different role in every FF game. In this one, he's a robot butler. In FF7, he was a fully fledged party member. In FF15, he's a mechanic with a daughter that gives Riku a run for her money in Thirst Trap of the Year award. And in Final Fantasy VIII, he's played by Robin Williams. And last but by no means least, we have Moogle Pirates. Unlike the absolute serial killer that is Tom Berry, I find this Moogle the cutest little cupcake in all of Frostyville. And a Moogle can never disappoint, whether it's Mog from FF6, a Glow Moogle, a Moogle Doll from FF10, Organization 13 Moogle. But these pirate Moogles, who are called Q Pirates, are easily my favorite of the bunch. All Moogles are welcomed, except for this monstrosity. And since our boy Q Pirate is also a Mirage, I want to give a quick shout out to Tamahime, the evolution or transfiguration, as I should say, of this game's Tama. Yurugu, the nigger Scott version of Tama, and Pikachu's Rest in bitch face cousin, Ifrita, the gender swap version of Ifrit, who I adore because she is basically the Mamacita version of Ifrit, Glow Moogle, the Goku Snake Way version of a Moogle, but second fiddle to Q Pirate, he's a freaking Moogle Pirate. How many times do I have to explain this to you? The Undead Princess, beautiful, beautiful off the wall character in both in terms of design and characteristics. I'm really glad she got second life in this game from Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Echoes of Time. Nerve Valifor, the Strokes This Is It album cover of FF10's Valifor. You could switch out either one to be honest, but I just slightly prefer this design here in this game. The Quacho Queen, the penguin lesbian queen who hates all men including our amigo Lan, but she's number one in your heart, Tom Berry King. I know, I know, I just ripped Tom Berry a new 
Oh, earlier, but Tomberry King? He's blinged out like Notorious B.I.G., son. And my other big papa, Pelberry King. He's the cold as ice version of Notorious B.I.G. In short, if Tomberry equals Sus King, this Tomberry equals Lush King. Kaguya Flan, the only flan that will look back at you in misery while you try to eat it. Iris, elegant and goldenly beautiful, who will phoenix down your party members if fallen. Iris would fit right in the Final Fantasy X universe for sure. Magitek Armor, come on, I get to walk around in the Magitek Armor from the greatest Final Fantasy of all time in FF6. XG, huge, 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 huge props for Square Enix for this one. They actually acknowledge the best PS1 RPG they ever produced in Xenogears, and for the record, this too is wonderful, you ingrate. Stop dogging on it so hard, alright? To get XG, you have to make your way through a secret dungeon, and the dialogue when finding XG is actually pretty great. Because I don't think they're supposed to put it in this game. Whoa! Don't say another word! This thing is right where it's supposed to be! Um... Sorry? Rain just stopped a world much the bigger than this one from imploding. Dude, really? And this is the only time in this game I will actually change the Mirage's name to its true name. That's better. Omega God. Literally a freaking Megazord and would have actually fit rather perfectly in Xenogears, truth be told. The entire transfig evolution of Daigoro, Gamut, and Yojo Jimbo. Yojimbo is a staple in a lot of previous FF games, and this is my favorite incarnation of him. Check this out. Chivalry is a ledge and gender swap of my Bay Shiva, and he's like a really over the top, like superhero Superman type, all about justice and honor, and would fit really perfectly at home in a Monty Python sketch. Shiva Zion. As much as Final Fantasy XIII sucks donkey, the world of Final Fantasy version of Shiva Zion is bad ass. And of course, as alluded to earlier, my true love, my muse, the most beautiful girl in the world, my wife. As she looks at me as I'm recording this footage. Maybe I'll keep this in. <laughs> Maybe I'll keep this in, okay. But for a video game, pass. is Shiva. Could you be the most beautiful girl in the world? But wait. She has an OnlyFans! Shiva, with two Vs, is the gothic BDSM version of Shiva, and she is best girl always. 2B, eat your heart out. The worlds within World of Final Fantasy Maxima. are split up into three categories. You have your towns, your areas, and of course, your dungeons. With a pseudo, and I mean super pseudo, world map that you can actually eventually access via a very pseudo airship which I'll talk about later because I got issues with it. Your hub world is the previously mentioned Ninewood Hills, a complete ghost town with skyscrapers with only a few mirages, which is ran by God herself. In this hub world, you can switch out your mirages, talk to your buddy Tama, stock up on items, grab a coffee, access the Coliseum if you're brave enough to talk to Mr. Shanky Shank. You can talk to the girl who forgot her name and do intervention side quests, go home to the twins room, which actually reminds me of my youth digs a little bit. You can sleep to regenerate all your HP and AP, interact with your PlayStation 1x64 to view the Mirage menu, Who's Who's Glossary, and the mini games. But you don't want to touch the mini games, trust me. But to dive deeper into the world of Grimoire, you must access the main gate. Think all killer, no filler. You get Cornelia from FF1, Niflheim from FF7, Figaro Castle from FF6, my favourite, uh, Port Besaid from uh, Final Fantasy X. You thought that I loved Turtle Guy on the internet was cool. He's got nothing on this guy. Turtle! 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 10 out of 10. 
Also, pro tip, don't forget to draw a ride on your Mirages and Magitek Armor, where with the Magitek Armor, it's a rite of passage, you have to enter the ice region near Shalada's Solace and go for a spin with Taras theme playing. In regards to dungeons, they play out in a standard format, you battle and catch Mirages here, you have treasure chests, and access secret fights with rare Mirages in pocket dimensions in the Murkrift, and it does a similar thing to what Pokemon does with Surf and Cut to access areas. Fire Mirage Mirages can fire you out of cannons and melt ice. Flying mirages help you over drop ledges. Golden gym members break through obstacles and uniquely to the world of Final Fantasy, there are certain sections that require stacking certain weight and attributes of mirages to contain more rare items and mirages and things of that nature. Just a little, uh, you know, pathway they block off for you to collect more mirages so you can then access these rare items later. I like this feature a lot gives the dungeons more replay value for sure. My favourite dungeons are the lower sea because you get to ride on a Mershak back, the windswept mirror just because it looks very beautiful despite the gross mirages there, the train graveyard purely because we get best girl vampire rain you know, uh, the sunken temple, the underwater dungeon where you can walk up walls, fight sea mirages and home of our lord and saviour, the Coacho queen. Watch out if you're a dude like Lan you might just have a slap waiting for you and last but not least Forest Lake because you have my main squeeze unit in her element. Despite being not as grandiose as Square Enix AAA efforts, the environments in World of Final Fantasy Maxima. really nails what it's going for. A Final Fantasy setting in its purest form and this screams fantasy unlike anything Final Fantasy 15 had to offer around the same time. Ironically, the chibi cuteness Final Fantasy game has more depth, colour and life than the realistic dreary washed out worlds of Final Fantasy 15. Speaking of which, I find it very clever how World of Final Fantasy uses a garnishing blur magnifying glass filter effect that really helps with the draw distance for the polygons in the background. Some people might find this a major shortcut but when you're introduced to Grimoire for the first time it just works perfectly for me. Thankfully, the one thing that has always been prominent and never fails to impress with Squaresoft and Square Enix titles throughout the years is the sound design and the soundtrack to every title with World of Final Fantasy being no exception. The opening title song and the main theme of the game is Innocent 2. Innocent 2? Innocent Squared? Either way, this is a J-pop vibrant tune full of passion and joy that builds up softly and in strong. This is the song I will be covering at the end of the review, sprinkled in with the best song in the game, the Besaid theme, World of Sunshine. Innocent 2 is composed by Ryu Yamazaki and originally performed by Mizuki, who do a, a tremendous whopper job here. Other standout tracks on here to check out would be Rain's Melody, Happy Melody, which has the most adorable piccolo flute recorder or whatever woodwind instrument that is, extremely peppy and way better than... World of Ninewood Hills uses some experimental breakbeats that are to die for. Victory Melody sounds exactly what the title suggests with sweeping violins and flutes. Hang about. I just realized while editing this video they never did a rendition of the classic Final Fantasy Victory theme. You know, you know, the, the, the chime, this one. World of Addy, providing some lovely string arrangements and sounding like something out of a Richard Curtis movie. Labyrinth of Dragons, which has beautiful delayed acoustic guitar effects. Unhappy melody that spearheads an eerie piano aesthetic. Another world of battle theme that delivers so much freaking bounce. It sounds like it's from a new season of Fall Guys. Cowan's Melody, the chibi post credit song World Parade, which sounds freaking squishable and adorbs, so if you don't love this, then you, you just don't have any soul really. They have new renditions of past classics, titles Priz Melody, with standouts being Priz Melody, The Scene of Battle, FF1, Pirates Ahoy, FF5, Library of the Ancients, Edgar Theme, Terror Theme, Decisive Battle Theme, Those Who Fight, Those Who Fight Further, Balam Garden, Don't Be Afraid, A Fleeting Dream, The Sending, Blitz Off, Xanakin, Chocobo Wishes, and Blinded by Light. 
Night. Along with the main theme, Innocent 2 being one of my favourites, it's also a close call between these last three songs. Ending Melody, which is the most beautiful exhale violin piece on the entire soundtrack. Moonlight Melody, now this will make you bawl your eyes out with its piano melody that sounds like it's bringing a music box to life. And finally, World of Sunshine, aka Beside Theme. This song incorporates everything I just described in every song previously. Peppy woodwind instruments, looping acoustic guitars with lush pianos, followed by a gorgeous, glorious string section and percussion. World of Sunshine would be perfect for an early sunrise spring bike ride to amplify its beauty. What a wonderful OST world of Final Fantasy provides here. On the sound design side of things, it's your standard fare really, with no glaring issues at all. The classic random encounter also has a nice chime to it as well, with there being no audio issues at all in regards to music and to the voice acting dialogue level, so two thumbs up guys, really good stuff. However, if you're a bloody Vita lover, you're gonna have to download the free World of Final Fantasy English VO pack for the voice acting if you want to hear Lan's lovely profanities. Come on! is wrong with us? Enough of this clap trap, Shenron. Let's show the people how this story ends. <laughs> After the first ending, you get prompted to say, No! In a dream state, Tama in a Tamahime transfiguration sacrifices all her lives to give Rain a second chance with her brother, Lan. So they jump back to a timeline just before they're about to stop the three heralds in the final battle. Lan, in this alternate reality, has no idea what's going on, and with Tama no longer being around, rest in bitch face Seraphy takes over as the support role. Before they can shut down the Ultima Gate and the Three Heralds however, they have to catch more Mirages and catch the seven legendary Grimoire Region Pokemon, I mean Mirages. The seven Lords, aka the Pleiad, are as followed. Our old Doggo Ifrit, Gandalf Understudy Ramu, Jetpack for Wings but Insecure Bahamut, Diablos, the Spanish Devil, Leviathan, the Sea Dragon, and I hate to say it but Leviathan looks better in Final Fantasy XV. <laughs> I'd take it back, Final Fantasy XV sucks. Odin, the ghost rider whose horse has six legs. Rapidash, eat your heart out. And it goes without saying, Sheba. And if you're wondering about Tama, don't worry, we bring Tama back to life through some timeline trickery thanks to the girl who forgot her name. Once all the seven lords are imprisoned and we have Tama back in our ranks, we head to the Ultima Gate to finally stop the free herald. Seguarades, aka Pops, is up first. He is defeated with tears in Lan's eyes. Pelinor, aka Mum, is second. Almost defeated with tears in everyone's eyes, but Lady Luce has to do the most lackluster Super Saiyan This Isn't My Final Form transformation by wearing a helmet. Yep. That's the form. Then Lady Luce is defeated. Now all that's left is the Herald King himself, Brandilus. His final form is the exact same as Ansem's from Kingdom Hearts 1. You know the one. The squid spaceship devil sea monster looking thing. As Rain and Lan put a stop to Brandilus, the summoners Yuna, Terra, Rydia and Aiko, along with Awen, reverse engineer the Ultima Gate, putting a stop to the Cogna Swarm, the Baha Mushin Federation and Brandilus. With encouragement from our ghost parents, Lan puts Brandilus in a cage, in a cage, in a cage, in a rat in a cage. Brandilus is now at a standstill and gets windswept towards the Ultima Gate. Brandilus is almost vanquished but breaks free and tries to take Owen with him. Before the tables can turn, Super kick! by Rain, then by Lan. But to make sure Brandilis is gone for good and to atone for their sins, Rain and Lan sacrifice themselves. And a crow looks on and the goddess says we can rest now. From here you can tie up any Lady Loose ends as the player gets to control Awen, and Enna Crow reincarnates Rain and Lan as Mirages as a reward for saving Grimoire. This is a really fun little way to still have Rain and Lan in your party while you 100% your game. The additional Maximum. story content however is very lackluster and extremely rushed. It's just Awen at the top of Ninewood Hills Tower where the ultimate gate was to find a dark portal that opens up and a Diablos tries to attack us but gets dog collared back into the portal by Lan. A very brooding Lan with cloud attire from KH1 vibes who is supporting Rain's armor guard. Lan is in the darkness trying to battle the voices in his head with dialogue from Odin, Diablos, Awen, etc, etc. Then the darkness fades away and Lan is back in Ninewood Hills. End scene.
It's believed that depending on how well the Maximum. DLC sold would indicate if we would get a sequel to World of Final Fantasy. Maximum. And this was just a little tease. Think Eternal Calm, a bridge between Final Fantasy X to Final Fantasy X 2. However, it's been three years with no sign of a new game being in development. This is a crying shame because there's so much untapped Final Fantasy content that would be perfect for a World of Final Fantasy 2. And Lord knows why the budget was so undercut. I mean, somebody over there, please cut the check. Extra! Extra! We all are bodies! For extra credit, World of Final Fantasy Maximum. has some delightful offerings like a free dungeon demo on the PlayStation Store going over its combat for both the PS4 and I think the PS Vita? Maybe? Maybe not? Anywho, for PS4 users at least, if this review didn't convince you or not, why don't you give it a try for free, uh, just for the combat wise anyway, it's pretty fun. The extra content doesn't stop there though, as you can also download a free champion in Balthea from Final Fantasy XII. Pay content in the form of Mirage Creature Packs can also be found here as well. And if you still have that Day 1 Edition code, you get Lilikan Champion Sephiroth. Everyone loves bloody Sephiroth, don't they? Old Sephers. A white Chocobo, a Glow Moogle, and also a Red Bonnet Berry to get a head start. But pretty much all of this can be found in the Maxima DLC upgrade, which comes with with a bunch of new mirages and champions to collect and being able to carry actually 12 mirages in your party at one time instead of just 10 like the base game offered. And now you have the Chrono Trigger innovation that is the new game plus. Other additions include more intervention quests, a new EX dungeon with my favorite, and I mean favorite super boss ever, wink wink nudge nudge say no more Xena Gears. The immortal dark dragon boss as well has also been included and a G.O.D. in a crow boss battle. That's right, in the middle of a Starbucks. And a couple of small things like two extra champion jewels, the champion stones, which allows you to actually swap out Rain and Lan with the FF champions with their own signature moves, which I love. But more importantly for a JRPG, uh, you got those additional story elements as well. And to round it off, we have a fishing minigame with our pal Noctus. You know, the guy who went from being a part of a cinematic epic story to being on tour as the supporting act for S Cloud 7. Time for a reality check for not only myself, but for you, the fabulous viewer. Nothing's perfect, despite what star ratings and publications want you to think. No masterpiece is perfect. Not the Nas album Illmatic, not the Godfather trilogy, not even iCarly for the Nintendo Wii. World of Final Fantasy Maximum. does have some flaws. So the minor gripes I have with the game are as followed. The PS Vita download to have voice acting is pretty BS. I mean, maybe they could have actually put in the actual game. I'm no game developer. It's just a bit of a kick in the teeth. The ability to turn off random encounters is only present in the Steam version of the game, which is utter bull. I love playing this game, but when I'm doing side quests, mirage, imprisonment, or item collecting, I think having the ability to turn off encounters would speed up the process a lot. You can get a stealth marijuana, actually, that makes encounters less frequent, which does help a lot, don't get me wrong. But with its config menu being so robust, I'm just really surprised it's not featured in any other console versions of the game and only Steam. You get to switch out the Rainmaker and the Lawnmower Lilikin forms into Final Fantasy Chibi Champions with their own badass signature moves. This is awesome, like I really like this, but the downside is you can't use your super champion medal maneuver, which is a bit of a thunder see you next Tuesday if you know what I'm saying. Now moving on to the major issues, missing mirages from Maxima. PS4 port. Cactus Johnny, aka my favourite Cactuar, and Crimson Armor were both PSN digital pre-order bonuses when the game originally released. When they released Maximum. DLC, however, a couple of years later for the PS4, Xbox and Switch, both the Switch and Xbox versions of the game had those two mirages on disc and cartridge, and I assumed the digital storefronts for both systems as well because it makes sense as Maximum. was advertised as all previous DLC included 
included, but the PS4 never got a physical version of it. And on the digital version, they didn't include those mirages in the Maxima. content. Granted, they are just palette swaps of Magitek armor and a Cactua, but it shouldn't be that hard to include them. I mean, where was the oversight here? It's just, you know, mirages on a list you gotta tick off. And the same thing can be said about our friend Boko the Chocobo. Exclusive to the Steam version, once again, Steam players get all the extra content. Enter the DLC, uh, the Xbox versions have Boko, the Switch version have Boko, but once again, not present on the PS4 content. And this one hurts more, because Boko's photo is literally advertised in the Creature Pack thumbnail. That's just false advertising, lads. Not as severe, Magitek Armor P, which you can actually get on the PS4 version. Finally, something you can actually get on the PS4 version, not exclusively uh, nuzlocked out elsewhere. You just have this one caveat though, you have to play the demo first before you play a new save file of World of Final Fantasy Maxima. or World of Final Fantasy Vanilla. So as you can tell, with the time exclusivity of some of these mirages not making its way to the PS4 version of World of Final Fantasy Maxima. and its DLC, for me personally, that makes the Nintendo Switch version the definitive version of the game. Nothing against you, Phil. I just, I have no reason to play the Xbox. None whatsoever. I like Game Pass, though. That's kind of cool. The airship in this game. I said in the beginning, this airship was false advertising. And let me explain why. See, when my wallet monster sees the PS Vita console edition on eBay for the price of a mortgage payment, I think to myself, hey, that's a cool cover. I'm flying on Noah's Ark with my Mirage's 2x2 hurrah, causing destruction and havoc in my wake. Awesome. It's nothing to write home about and it handles piss poorly. Won't spend too long explaining, but these are airships. These are not. This is an airship. This is an airship. But the absolute worst and borderline criminal thing about this game relates to a certain DLC. So, to promote the January 2017 release of the game package that is Kingdom Hearts HD 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue that so happens to be in my favourite series of all time being the Kingdom Hearts Dark Seeker Saga minus the mobile slash PC browser game horse the back cover X movie dog sh and anything post KH3 Remind DLC but plus the world ends with you and the world ends with you final remix because it's tubetacular dude. They added the main protagonist Sora with his Keyblade and all as a Lilikan champion medal to the game for free no less. I love Kingdom Hearts and free DLC. I would love to download it. Come on, come on. I'd love to give you my money in that room. This clearly shows who wears the trousers in the Kingdom Hearts relationship of Square and Disney. Guess I'll just watch an endless loop of Sora's champion attack on repeat over and over and over and over. Leave the memories alone. Thank you for watching episode one of Blender Reviews for World of Final Fantasy Maxima. <laughs> now, if you enjoyed the video, uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel. It means a lot. And if you want to stalk me on my social medias, it's all art minus me. Just make sure you stalk respectfully. Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Twitch, usual suspects. And I did promise a performance at the end of the review. I will be performing World of Sunshine plus Innocent 2, the best songs in this game. <laughs> now without further ado, should have said something, but I've said it enough. By the way, my words were faded. Rather waste my time with you. Hashtag, I'll see myself out. <laughs>
けすぜてもう君を手を離さに胸の痛めを知っているからたとえ苦にせのよるが僕らを助かっつもハロウィンラー I'm not afraid.